Okay, so uh, in chapter 12, we're going to introduce you to capital investments. Uh, the purpose is this assisted introduction. Um, we are going to be doing the, the first two learning objectives. Um, and that's basically about it. The other topics you'll be learning if you take an intermediate accounting class or um, once you take your, your first finance class, because you'll be doing corporate finance as a junior in, uh, at a, at a four-year school, it's a 300 level class, and you'll be introduced to uh, inter, uh, internal rate of return, things like this. Okay. So uh, a capital budget uh, is a budget for long-term, um, property plant and equipment, things that are going to be used to generate revenue for the company, help them sell uh, more stuff. And so there's a separate budget for capital projects than there is, say, operational budget or production budget or so forth. Um, and basically, this revolves around a particular project. Um, and it's going to be looked at by a specific committee to determine whether it's worth funding. You're going to learn how they make those decisions uh, and how then the board of uh, directors is the only group that can approve this in a corporate form. There's usually a, a prescription or a process that's uh, done for any type of capital budgeting process. Uh, a project is proposed. Um, it usually is quite detailed in terms of what it needs, what the purpose of is it, what the payoff looks like. The proposals are screened by a, uh, a specific committee dealing with capital budget items. Um, the corporate officers are going to determine whether it's worthy of funding, whether it's worthy of funding. And then the board of directors takes that uh, recommendation from management uh, and approves that for for you. So this is sort of the process that happens in the corporate form. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. So for capital budgeting purposes, they actually rely on cash flow, and so uh, they look at cash coming in and cash going out or cash inflows and cash outflows. That's basically how they are going to be judging whether uh, a capital project is going to be funded or not, it's going to be approved. Okay. And the reason they use the uh, cash flow, cash in and out, is because we can actually calculate the value of those cash flows because it becomes in essence an investment by the company. So again, the capital budgeting projects, you know, building a new factory, upgrading equipment, doing this, doing that, is really an investment in making more money in the future. And so by using the cash flows of in and out uh, for that project, we're able to calculate the value and to see whether it's actually gonna be paying off or not. And you're gonna get a quick introduction to that today. So what are the cash flows that are related to capital budgeting? Budgeting. In terms of what's going out, right? They need to make that initial investment in the project. Um, because these projects involve property plant and equipment, there's gonna be repairs and maintenance as ongoing. Uh, there's gonna be some increased costs for operating the business. And of course, there may be an overhaul of the equipment to make sure it's going to be uh, lasting its useful life. So those are some outflows that they're going to be considering. But of course, there are some inflows, cash inflows. You uh, uh, can sell the old equipment and that's, that is cash coming in. So that's an inflow. Uh, because you'll be producing things more efficiently, uh, hopefully you'll be selling more, you're going to receive more cash from customers. And so that is an inflow. Um, you might be able to become very efficient where your operating costs in some other areas are going to be re reduced. 
And that reduced cost is technically an inflow because that cash is staying in. Um, and of course, there's some salvage value of equipment that you've used uh, in that process. Okay. So the decisions are gonna be based on a number of different things. Are there funds available in the, in the corporation to be used to uh, for this particular project? Uh, what's the relationship to the project to um, what the company is doing or where it wants to go? Um, what is the, how does the company make decisions? And who, does, who do you have to uh, really get on board for you to have any hope that the project is gonna take off? And all companies are gonna look at the risks that they're taking with a particular project. Uh, they like investing in different ideas and different projects, um, but they wanna make sure that there's not excessive risk because that's gonna make the project, uh, well, then that, that availability of funds, maybe those funds can be used for better things if the project is too risky. So here's an example that shows um, Stewart Shipping Company. They are looking to purchase new equipment for $130,000. The equipment is going to be used for 10 years, after which it will have no salvage value. Okay. Well, look at the cash flows. Well, if they make this investment, they are going to receive an additional $200,000 from, from customers coming in but they are gonna have operating costs of 176,000 to cover. So actually the net cash flow is $24,000 a year if they did this. Is it a good deal? Should they do it? Well, it depends. They're, they're gonna look at a few things. One of the things that they're looking at is the cash payback tick, uh, period. You know, uh, How quickly are they gonna be recovering the money that they put into the project? So this is called the cash payback technique. And it really is meant to identify that time period that allows the company to recover the costs of the investment. Um, they recover it from the annual cash flow produced by that investment. Okay. So the cost of the investment, which we know in this particular case, that $130,000 new equipment is going to be the cost they'll divide into it the that net annual cash flow, which as you saw on the previous slide is about $24,000 a year. So what's the payback period? Well, if you fill in the blanks, you'll see that this particular uh, investment will pay back uh, the full amount in 5.42 years or less than five and a half years, okay? Now that's usually considered a good thing because um, the shorter the payback period, the more attractive the investment is to the company. And they don't really want to wait forever. They don't want the payoff to be in the ninth, eighth, ninth year of, of, a, of a 10 year uh, project. They're looking uh, for something a lot quicker. So this, uh, this provides a, a better, you know, a shorter payback period, which means uh, it's gonna, it's probably gonna be, um, uh, in, uh, the investment is probably going to be approved. Okay, uh, but this is only—I mean—that particular uh, example back here is the payback period of twenty-four thousand is every year for ten years in this particular example, and most investments don't work that way. It's not like it's a steady cash flow every single year uh, for for the whole ten years. In many cases, the cash flow is going to be uneven. There's going to be some years where the cash flow is lighter than others uh, from any particular project. And so uh, what we have to do then, uh, the company has to use a different method to find out what, uh, what's going to happen in terms of whether they should actually fund it. So they look at the cumulative net cash flow, right, the total amount cumulative, and they compare it with the cost of the investment. Uh, it has to at least equal, if not be greater than the cost of the investment for things to work out. So here is uh, here's an example of uh, Chen Company. 
they have a proposal for an investment in your website. Uh, the cost is $300,000 for the website, okay? So that's the investment of $3,000 here. What they're looking for is every year the website is up, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, they are projecting different annual cash flows, okay? So the inflow is going to be greater than the outflow in year one by 60,000. So thus it's cumulative is 60,000 because it started. But look in that second year, they're going to receive, they're, they're expecting to receive 90,000 more cash coming in than out. Well, that means that the cumulative effect are these two years combined or 150,000, right? In the third year, they're expecting another 90,000. Uh, in cash flow, net cash flow, more cash in than out for this project. So then these three would be the cumulative of 240,000. Well, look, they invested 300,000. And after the third year, they're almost there. They're almost there, right? But look, that fourth year, they're really raking it in, right? 120,000 more uh, cash coming in and, and needing to go out that boosts their cumulative to 360. So again, 360 is higher than the 300. So somewhere in here between year three and year four, uh, they have already made back the entire investment amount. And now they're starting to see a payoff from that investment. In the third, uh, in the final year, it's 100,000. So in this case, the payback period um, for this particular uh, proposal for your investment is three and a half years. Again, that's a short payback period. That's a very, very short payback period. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, what's ex that's what's expected. And that's how they're gonna make that particular decision. So here is a question that has a $100,000 investment. Uh, no scrap value, they're hoping uh, to last 200, sorry, eight years, um, eight years. Uh, it asks you to compute the payback period uh, if the straight depreciation is used. So a thousand, hundred thousand uh, investment is depreciated over that eight year period straight line, all right? So equal parts. Uh, and if the net income is $20,000, right? So uh, in this case, when you go back here, uh, in this case, the, the payback period, you're gonna have the total amount uh, divided, well, you're gonna have, I'm sorry. In this case, you're going to need to calculate what the uh, the cash flow is going to be every particular year, um, and what you'll see is that over that eight year period, it's going to be um, twelve and a half to twelve thousand five hundred per year. Right. That's going to be the uh, straight line. Um, so. Uh, Plus, they're going to, so that's going to be cash out. Uh, the net income is twenty thousand cash in. So when you get uh, past that three year mark, in this case, you're going to uh, you're going to you're going to get payback. Uh, this is a better example here uh, because this one's in your book, so it's a little easier to follow as well. So here they have a paper corporation. They want to uh, add another machine that makes, uh, that manufactures corrugated cardboard. Uh, this is a pricey uh, piece of equipment, $900,000. It's gonna last for six years. They think the annual cash flow is going to increase by $400,000. Um, but uh, the cash the cash outflow is going to increase by uh, one ninety, so four hundred more coming in, one hundred and ninety going out, so two hundred and ten. Right? What's the payback period? 
So they have uh, a total difference of 210,000, right? Because the cash coming in is greater than the cash going out by 210,000. So how long will it take to, re to recoup uh, this? Uh, 4.3 years. So it's a very, very short period of time uh, that they'll be, uh, uh, that they'll be able to recover. So um, not bad, not bad at all. Okay, so I'm sorry about uh, any particular um, confusion on, on the explanation there. Uh, it's just easier when it's already done out. Um, whereas when they throw those questions uh, randomly in there, it's like, I have to explain this and it's hard enough. <laughs> so, um, so that's objective one in a nutshell, calculating the, uh, the cash payback period. Um, is really sort of the goal here. And you're just gonna get a few questions on it um, to make sure you understand it for homework. Not bad. Okay, the next part, learning objective two is um, a little bit trickier because here we're doing uh, net present value method. Uh, there's actually two methods that are used. Uh, we're going to focus on the net present value uh, method in this class. You'll again, you'll get IIR, IRR in uh, intermediate accounting. Uh, and if not, you'll certainly get it in, in your corporate finance class for sure when you, when you transfer to that. Okay. Um, businesses tend to use discount, a discounted cash flow technique as the best approach to decide whether a project should be funded or not. Okay. Um, and the method that's widely used, well, both of them are widely used, but the method we're going to be focusing on in this class is net present value, since that is important. So the net present value method, right, shows the cash flows for every year, but they are, and of course, this might be a 10 year project, it might be a 20 year project. So you're gonna see cash flows calculated for every single year. Well, what are those cash flows worth now? Right, so you're expecting $100,000 in 20, the year 2030, all right, well, we're in the year 2020, what's that money worth now? So when you use the present value uh, method, you're simply taking future expected dollars and converting it into today's money so you can see whether it's a good deal or not, whether you should be doing it or not. Uh, and only in that way, you can compare it with what the money you have to lay out today to do the project. Uh, for this future cash flow, you know, this future profit uh, you need to invest in today. So using the present value method helps you understand how we look at things uh, and decide things today that would affect, in essence, numbers in your future. Um, in order to do a discounted method, as you know, we need to determine um, a minimum interest rate or a minimum rate of return, which would be our interest rate, because we have to use present value tables, which are, are organized by interest rates and periods of time. And so in order to use the present value uh, system, we need to understand what's the minimum rate of, rate of return, which then becomes our interest rate. And what period of time is this project going to be, um, is projected to last, you know, 10 years, 20 years, what have you. Then we have factors that we can use to discount that cash flow. Once we discount the cash flow, we can add them up to see whether the uh, net present value of all that cash flow is either zero, which means it sort of breaks even with the, with the minimum rate of return, 
or positive, which means that it's actually going to pay off. It's actually a, a profitable, more profitable uh, project than we we uh, than we thought of. If it is uh, at least negative or or a positive return after we discount all that money, we should do it. We should do it. However, uh, if it doesn't meet our minimum rate of return, um, then the net present value might be negative. And if it's a negative net present value when you're discounting all this future cash flow, uh, you should stay away from it. Don't do it. So in essence, when a corporation is looking at a project to lay out a lot of money, um, when that uh, when they convert the cash flow into net present value, the higher that number is in the positive territory, the more attractive the investment because it's really going to pay off. So this is how it works. This particular illustration uh, is in your book. It is on page five hundred and eighteen. Uh, it's a good one to look at. Five hundred and eighteen. Okay. Um, and it sort of explains how proposals are usually accepted or, or rejected or acceptable or not, or should be rejected. So basically every proposal is going to have a series of cash flow to it. As you saw in learning objective one, um, your net cash flow needs to be positive. So you have your present value of your net cash flows for a period of time. You take away what the company is going to invest in the project as the capital investment. That is going to equal the net present value of the project. If you're at zero or more higher, then it's, it's a good project to do and the co corporation should fund it. However, if that net present value is negative, that means that the project is too risky, doesn't have a higher rate of, rate of return to, uh, uh, to provide um, uh, a, a reasonable expectation of return on that capital. And so it's rejected, it's rejected. So this is what you're gonna be seeing play out in this part of the chapter. So here's the illustration. And this is on the bottom of page one, uh, 518 as well. It shows a shipping company, Stewart Shipping Company, has annual cash flows are 24,000. So this is an annual cash flow where we're assuming is the same for a period of time. Okay. Uh, if we assume this amount is uniform, same amount, over the assets useful life, which they are saying it's 10 periods, we can compute the present value of that net cash flow. Okay. So, in other words, um, if you look at the $24,000 a year over 10 years, it looks like $240,000 because. When you multiply that by 10 years, that's what it comes out to. But what is actually in today's money? In today's money? Well, in order for us to figure that out, we need two things. The number of years that we're going to be looking at, so 10. And what is the minimum rate of return that the company is seeking? So once we know it's 12% and 10 years, we can look in, uh, in Appendix A. Appendix A in your book shows uh, a, a table, present value table. And there you'll see that the factor at 10 years and 12% is 5.65022. Okay. This number comes from Appendix A present value table, number one, okay. So you take the $24,000, which is the annual cash flow, and you multiply it by 5.65022, which is the present value discount factor 
for 10 periods at 12%, and that will equal $135,605, okay? Well, you might recall from the early, an earlier slide that the company is putting up $130,000 for this equipment. So if the present value of the cash flow says it's actually worth $135,605 and you're putting up $130,000, then you have a positive difference of $5,605, which means that this particular project should be a profitable venture for the company to do because it's net present value, the difference between the present value of the net cash flow and what it's asking for an investment up front, which is 130 for the new equipment, will give the company a payoff of 5605 based on that model. So again, because it's higher than it's zero or it's higher than zero, it's positive, the company should accept it. And I hope that's what this says. Yes, it's, it is acceptable because the net present value is zero or positive, greater than zero in this case. So this is how they would uh, make, excuse me, that decision. This particular um, illustrations on the top of page 519, okay, showing how they calculated this. Again, in order to make sure you, you get the, um, uh, the, the present value, the discount factor, you're gonna look at appendix A and you'll see the intersection of the interest rate, which is the rate of return that's required minimum and the discount period. Where those, where that column and row meet, you'll see this factor. That's the factor we use in calculating um, the cash flow in this case, okay? So that's part of the homework that you're gonna be looking at is uh, understanding how to use that the present value tables in, in Appendix A in this book. Um, there are present value tables that are all over the internet as well. <laughs> um, and so that's, uh, that's another thing you can look at. <clears throat> but it's probably better just to get to know your book. Here is another illustration that shows instead of you know equal payments of 24,000 a year for 10 years, what if you have a project that sort of ebb and flows um, and the cash flow is unequal year to year? Well, then we can still do the net present value, but we're going to need to do things a little bit differently here. Okay. So here's the illustration. Uh, Stuart shipping expects the same total cash flow of $240,000, right? To 24,000 at 10 years over the course of the investment. But because it's a declining market demand, uh, the net cash flows are higher in the early years and lower in the later years. So it's not like an even 24,000 every year for 10 years. Uh, the early years, years one, two, three, four, five, for example, will be higher than that. The years later on, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, for example, will be lower than that. So how do we calculate at that? Well, it's a little bit trickier because what you have to do now is use um, a, a, a discount factor, okay, uh, for for the amount, this is also part of Appendix A, Appendix A. Uh, but the table, and I'm going to go back in here. So in my book, so I can be sure I'm giving you the right information here. 
uh, the table in this case is going to be um, uh, present value of an annuity of a dollar table of four in this case. So for here, you've got um, you've got in year one, one year at 12%, the factor is 0.89268. Okay. Actually, it's it's the exact same. No, it's actually back to table three. It's actually the exact same as table three. 0.89268. Uh, for year two, which is her second year at 12%, notice how the factor is now 0.79719 because under that 12% two years, the factor is different. Okay. So for each year, this is the cash flow. See how it's larger in the early years? And then as the uh, years go by, the cash flow declines a lot still equals that same 10 year period of 240. But instead of nice equal payments of 24,000 each year over 10 years, their payments are higher in the early years, lower in the later years. So that means we literally have to calculate each particular year. So this is a three years at 12%. If you look at table three again, three years, 12% is point. 0.71178. So notice that here the present value is calculated by the amount in column one times the factor in column two. So 34,000 times 0.8286 is 30,000. This is the present value of the first year's cash flow. The present value of the second year's cash flow is 23, right? 916. That's this times this, uh, 27,000 times 0.7178 gives you the present value of the cash flow for year three. And you do the same thing all the way down for each of the 10 years. Uh, again, 12% at each value is going to show up as a different factor in table three. So not only is this is Appendix A, but let me make it very clear now that you're going to be using table three in Appendix A to get the factors here. Okay. Um, and notice that um, you need to figure this out to add up the total present value um of this money but it's uneven uneven cash flow so as you see the actual pr uh, net present value is 144,367 they're only asking for a $130,000 investment up front so this is actually going to pay a much higher return right this is actually a, a much greater return than the original one that had steady uh, cash flows of 24,000 a year for that 10 year uh, period, okay? So again, the higher this number is, uh, the better uh, that the uh, investment is gonna pay off. But that's how you have to calculate it for um, unequal amounts of cash flow per year. Whereas the first part was simply equal payments every year for the period of time. That's really the difference here. Um, okay, back up to chapter 12 we go, for me in the book anyway. Um, the last thing we're doing in this part of the chapter is understanding first how they choose uh, a discount rate. Um, so basically what we're looking at um, is you, you have to find out what's the required rate of return that the company is, is looking for before it makes any investments in projects that come from 
various departments or so forth. Um, and so that's one of the most important things, what's really required in the company's mind. And usually that takes the form of, well, how much is it gonna cost us? The cost of the capital is only one part, okay? The other part is the risk, is the risk. Uh, because, you know, the cost of capital needs to also include that the riskier the investment is, the higher the required rate of return is gonna be. Um, that's how in all investors feel. Investors feel that if I'm gonna make a riskier investment of capital, I want a higher return than if I did not do it, if I made another investment with a less risky um, venture. And so that's really, you know, how they come up with the these discount rates, which we use in those present value charts, okay? So again, um, you can look at the rate as, this is just other ways it's known, uh, required rate of return, the hurdle, the cutoff, what have you. But either way, uh, there has to be some, I, the company has an idea of what their required rate of return is to use up that type of capital. Remember the capital of the company is coming often from the stockholders, right? Um, and the lenders uh, that they have that, that uh, the other side of the balance sheet is where they get money. So if they wanna use that money, they have to be very wise in using it. And so they wanna make sure they, if they are gonna invest in a new project the company might be interested in doing, it's gonna return that. And, and it's a safe bet that they all have it. So let's go back to steward shipping. Um, and remember, steward shipping, we used a 12% discount rate when we figured out whether it was worth it or not to invest that $130,000 in new equipment. Uh, but let's suppose the, the assumption here is the risk of the project actually means that the rate should have been 15% instead of 12%, okay? Um, so as you see, instead of using the 12% as a factor for 10 periods, they should have used the 15% factors over that same 10 year period, in which case, um, these are just, this is for the first uh, example of 24,000 a year each year, so regular cash flow, equal cash flow payments over 10 years. So for that 12%, yeah, I would have returned 135. The present value would have been 135,605, which meant that that's more than what the investment cost. And so it's a good deal for the company to do. But what if the company thought it was a riskier project and needed a higher rate of return, required rate of return? Well, the factor 15% at 10 would have been 5.01877 multiply that by the 24,000 annual payments and cash flow that would have only been 120, which is short by almost 10 grand, which means if it's negative, it's a no-go. Anything below zero, no. Project is, is too risky. It's not working out. Don't invest, don't use the capital to do it. So again, uh, that net present value is the difference between, again, that risk has to be assessed properly and the company has to understand what it's rated yeah what it wants to have a required rate of return for any time it uses capital to fund the new project so there's some with these of course it, it can be very complex but there's some assumptions that make it simple to calculate uh, one is, is they're saying that all the cash flow is coming at the end of the year um, the cash flows are immediately invested in a project that has a similar return, and you can predict with certainty what the cash flows are going to be. So, again, as you know, the way academics work and mathematical equations work, there are certain assumptions that are built in in finance, economic theory, anything you look at, there are certain assumptions that are built in to making a hypothesis work or a theory work. So these are the assumptions in making that work for net present value. 
So I'm going to go right to, <laughs> I don't like explaining a lot of that stuff without it actually being written out here. Um, so let's go to a comprehensive example that wraps up this part. That starts on page 521 and ends on page 522. Okay. So this is page 521 and continues to 522. Uh, best taste foods. Sounds really good. They're considering investing in new equipment to produce fat free snack foods. Ooh. <laughs> Just joking. Um, so it's going to cost them a million dollars. I feel like Dr. Evil there. One million dollars. Um, that's the initial investment. Uh, it's going to cost them uh, an equipment overhaul in five years of $200,000. After the equipment is done, they're going to use it for 10 years and it's going to have a salvage value of 20 grand. And the cost of capital, which is the discount rate that's required, is 15%. So here's what we know. We know that the cash inflow is 500,000. Yay, that's good, it's coming in. Cash outflow, 200,000. Boo, that's going out. Maintenance cost, 30,000. Boo, going out. Direct operating cost, 40,000. Boo, going out. So what's the net? Well, it's the 500 minus the rest. That's gonna be your net. So that means that the net annual cash flow for this is $230,000. Uh, and that you can see on the bottom of page 521. Well, should they be doing it? Well, let's figure it out. Is it equal? Is it not equal? Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, oh, actually here, they're actually teaching you how to compute that net annual cash flow. Quite comprehensive in this case. So in the very, very first period of time, they're gonna to need to purchase the equipment before anything happens. So the equipment has to be bought. So in this case, uh, the factor is simply one. Uh, and so they're gonna be forking out a million bucks for that. Five years in, they're going to be forking out another 200,000 to overhaul the equipment and that they just bought. So the factor of uh, the discount rate, uh, 0.49718 is 15% intersecting with five years as a time period. So that means the overhaul in current monies is 99,436. It's happening five years from now, but at 200,000, but that's like spending 99,436 today. Okay, so they can have its present value there. It's going to have regular cash flows of 230,000 a year for 10 years. So 15% at, uh, at that time, time period gives you, of uh, 10 years, gives you a factor of 5.01877. So that's total cash coming in of 1,157,317 in today's money. And then in 10 years time, it'll have a $20,000 salvage value, which if you look at the factor of 15 and 10, um, for uh, you'll get 0 0.24719, and that will give you a current uh, present value of 49.44. So again, this is something you're gonna, you can sell or, or have as, as, a, as an asset. So it's technically cash in, that's how I look at it. So the net present value of this particular project looks like it would, could return in present value numbers, almost 60 grand. It's much greater than zero. And so this is a good deal for the company to do. 
And the wrap up here, do it exercise on page 522. Okay. And we're back to the paper corporation. And we are adding that machine for corrugated uh, cardboard. Okay, that's great. The machine cost $900,000, useful life of six years, no salvage value. The company estimates annual cash inflow would be increased by 400,000. The outflow would be increased by 190. They have a, a required rate of return of 9%, which now becomes your discount, right? Calculate the next present value on the project and discuss whether it should be accepted. So in this case here, we have, um, we have $400,000 of cash inflows minus 190 of cash outflows. So you have $210,000 of cash flow every year. Well, over that period of time, which in this case is six years, right? At 9%, um, six years at 9%, the factor would be 4.48592. That's from Appendix A, Table 4, in this case. And so your present value would be 942.043. Okay. <clears throat> your uh, capital equipment would cost 900,000 to do, which means in this case, your net present value is $42,000 above that, which makes it a really good deal for the company. So the value is greater than zero and thus the company should do it. Okay. And speaking of companies doing it, I'm done. <laughs> this company is done. <laughs> I think I can see you. So uh, how are we doing on that? Feeling all right? 